proclamations from his royal chamber, and instant, instantly his word is carried far and wide by an enormous network of messengers capable of spreading all the languages of the communities of this kingdom to all of the other places. It's a kingdom so successful and sumptuous in its excess, the most major drama that confronts King Xerxes is his wife's unwillingness to come to him when she's summoned. Queen wives being dispensable amid such easy cash, the king angrily decides to drop this queen and look for a new one out in the provinces. And all the fair young virgins of the empire are expeditiously brought before the king, and one catches his favor, Hadassah, or Esther, an orphan, abandoned, raised by her older cousin, descendant of refugees from the territory conquests and exiles of earlier years. Her inclusion in the kingdom is shaky, She's from a community that are strangers in a strange land, the result of displacement and diaspora. And thus, Esther's cousin instructs her to hide her true identity from the king. Dazzled by her beauty and ignorant of her story, the king makes her queen and plies her with ointments. At this time, the refugee community to which Hadassah belongs is becoming a perceived threat to the culture of the kingdom. They keep their own laws and not the king's. They keep their own company and by their very exiled status implicitly question the laws of obedience that the kingdom demands. They're a fly in the ointment, if you will, of authority. The king, ignorant of his wife's heritage, sends out an edict across the empire. This refugee community is to be destroyed. Now you can see the ethical dilemma that's placed before Hadassah, or Esther. Speak up, hone a principled honesty, and persuade the king to save her people, or remain silent. If she chooses the first path, she's exposed, vulnerable, able to be annihilated. If she chooses the second, she annihilates herself. She has no guarantees. Her cousin says, unhelpfully, mi odeur, who knows? Maybe for just this reason has fate brought you here. And on this question, God is silent. Here is a moment where our feral, desperate heroine is completely abandoned, belongs neither to the kingdom nor to the community that raised her, and yet is compelled, is perhaps uniquely necessary in carrying out a moment of activism on behalf of that community with no promise that she will survive. This is a story about the terrible, ambiguous reality of faith as it intrudes upon the moments in which we are poised by the manner of who we are to be agents of change with no direct line from God to save us. And so Hadassah goes into the future anxiously, blindly, without reassurance. She must make this decision alone. Now, the more I thought about this story, the more it seemed too tidy Esther uses what she knows, sure, to resist. She places her life on the line. But she's already inside the king's palace, accelerated there by her beauty, by forces outside of her own control. And she's able to hide who she is until it becomes politically expedient for her to unmask herself. In the bright light of 2016, these are ethics of privilege. She uses her power to correct the murderous whims of an empty, wealthy king. And in so doing, preserves a troublingly empty authority. And what of her cousin? who both encourages her deceit and then, when it leads her to potential annihilation, offers the super helpful, who knows? And this is not a story I wanted to tell, and yet it's a story my people tell. And it's a story I talked about with Dean Green here in this room a week and a half ago uh, when I asked her after she told me, maybe for just this reason has fate brought you here, what did you sacrifice to be able to be here. Esther's story believes in a romantic, heroic resistance. Today we're protesting sweatshops, the lack of renewable energy investments, food use, supremacist systems of incarceration. And soon the footage of our protest will be on Facebook and Instagram, dissected by proprietary algorithms, billions of bytes of data, to be remade into Apple commercials that interrupt Broad City, set to new music by John Bon Jovi, while a Kerouac quote spirals into the smoke billowing across the desert from Coachella, or Burning Man, or Pacific Gas and Electric. The rhetoric of heroism is a data mine for the system to reassert itself. Today's manifesto is tomorrow's jingle, or tomorrow's talking point, and that's assuming it has been said loudly enough by bodies who are allowed to say such things, such true things, loud enough. Isn't the very defini of definition of privilege the choice to act, the choice to yell? 
Tina Fey says that the hardest thing for young improv actors to learn is when to jump into a scene. They think that you jump in when you have something funny to say or when you want to jump in. But the answer is that you jump when you're needed. And if you're not needed, move out of the way. The real function of education as resistance works on this level, cultivating self-awareness. You have to know who you are in order to know what you're giving, when you have the privilege to choose to act, when it's not your story to tell, and when you're needed, even when you don't want to be. Some of us are resistors, not because we choose to be, but merely because of who we are and who the world says we are. And even if the privilege to resist could be corralled, marshaled, what allows unequal systems and oppressive systems to persist? In my experience, and I think you will agree, considering our own community here, habit, custom, and niceness, masquerading as normal forces, curb and limit justice. My colleague Francesca Coppa says that if you do, diversely, do diversity effectively as a community, Everyone is a little bit angry all of the time. <laughs> We're often so afraid of rupturing the tidy, mannered blanket of the social. We repair rents together. We smooth over real injustice with niceness. As Amber Frost has recently argued, civility is destructive because it has the potential to perpetuate falsehood, whereas vulgarity, exposing vulgarity, has real value in keeping us honest. But what if the sources of power seem so large as to be immovable, all-pervading? Karl Marx is credited with realizing, rather presciently, that the growth of free markets is nothing more than the annihilation of space by time. Go with me here. It starts with a neighborhood, and there's all these storefronts, places for you to spend your money. But once the car is developed, Goods can move further, and so can people. And progress is speed, and suddenly there's a Merritt Parkway, a New Jersey Turnpike, where storefronts used to be, and people who say things like, I'm from exit four, and airplanes that can jump at 600 miles an hour and 35,000 feet above the clutter of the past. Truly, time has flown, and space has been lost. And I became interested in the converse of this argument. Could one annihilate time with space? Slow the clock down. Slow it back to a rhythm of a breath. Grip the big hand and the little hand and hold it all steady by reinvesting in space. Resist speed, call a time out, and dwell patiently in the larger space of a moment. Would we see the infinite, the garden of forking paths always before us? Time forces flowers open as it patiently slow-mo hurls them into decay. And yet, in every moment, a thin potential, the fastest potential, faster than fleeting, mere picoseconds. The temporary illusion that you can slip through it, evade it, keep everything just as it is, out there, faster than light. My whole life I've felt this kind of urgency, an anxious fantasy, that I can get out ahead of it, hold it still in this perfect moment. All educators feel this urgency. What we're saying in class, in effect, is hurry, Take this. There's not a moment to lose. Careful. Doors are closing and will not reopen. Please wait for the next train. Now, I don't know if you've hung around little children in rectangular screens recently, but their engagement with technology is really stunning. I mean, my generation's strategy for getting information into and out of a screen used to be the crusty analog of typing, pressing letter keys to make words. The generation after us used a movable cursor controlled by a mouse, to move around a screen and engage with information by clicking it. But little kids go right up to the screen and touch it. They engage with virtual information with their very bodies. The problem with previous incarnations of information technology, it turns out, was that they were data poor. In contrast, these newer models have exponential access to data, finger hesitations, urgent gestures, aimless hand waving, as the body becomes increasingly immersed in systems of data collection, sold back to us as tailored entertainment. I spend a lot of time worrying about that. Soon I will have to watch an advertisement before I'm allowed to open the refrigerator, or start my car, or open my laptop, all as of yet on colonized markets. I realized that what was wanted now was a renewed belief in the radical individual, the resistant subject, the free agent, the pragmatic revolutionary. 
And this, of course, is exactly what your liberal arts education gave you. Four years to invest in what makes a radical individual, a resistant subject, a free agent, a pragmatic revolutionary. It's a hope that you can walk right up to someone and be angry for real reasons. It's the hope that microacts of resistance carried out by subjects adjacent to sources of power might slowly undo those systems, cause them to unravel, that one could opt out, that opting out or their critical awareness to opt out offered the slimmest chance at holding time accountable. Put another way, could one thwart a Google algorithm, stop social media from just giving you back yourself and others like you again and again? What false efficacy have we claimed as our own, even as we've been manipulated by these systems? Now that so much of my life is commodified and sold as data, my very body the cloud, coded into zeros and ones in an empty office building stuffed with perpetually blinking servers in downtown San Francisco, it's a feeble hope, this ownership. But you're going to be in charge of these systems, even as they define and hold you hostage. Being a grown-up, it will be tempting to resist resistance, Adopt what came before, replicate it just because you're tired and it's far easier to go right along. There's going to be a lot of bullshit you're going to have to wade through. Get a hobby. <laughs> Think of this space, these last few steps, as a plotting ground for future resistance. My former boss, the provost Margie Haas, used to say the point of college is to prepare students for a future moment of activism a terrifying existential moment lacking in divine certainty, in which we as educators won't be there. You'll be on your own. Toni Morrison says, all paradises, all utopias, are designed by who is not there, by the people who are not allowed in. Start by believing. You stumble forward into the future anyway. You crystallize around something anyway. You're going to be a monster so you might as well be a good monster. Your faith in one foot, and then the other. Then find the others, the ones off to the side, resisting. Build someone else's paradise, not your own, or not your own alone, and hurl well-considered bombs at the self-appointed gods who stand in your way. As I grew older, I learned that time loomed, looped back upon itself. If, as the physicists tell us, we occupy the multiverse, all paths simultaneously and recursive, then this is the meditation. When you go back to a place you used to live, don't you have the strangest feeling that a version of you still lives in there? That you could walk right up to the door, the front door, and demand to be let in, for you know the future, and there are so many things you want to say to that former version of you, the younger version of you, still living there. If this is the case, then some future version of you is here right now, driving by Muhlenberg on Chew Street, stopping, face plastered up against the window, urgently knocking, trying desperately to tell you the future, your future. The meditation is, please, whomever, let me hear this voice. Let me know what my future self so urgently wants to tell me. Because if this were tomorrow, you'd be standing in the doorway, looking back at the dining commons and you sitting here, tired and fearful and curious and a little drunk. <laughs> Bites of data, paused before a great moment of potential and slightly, ever so slightly, more resistant. You will never be rescued. You've already been rescued. Instead, you're lucky. You're held together by tenuous spawns, breaking. But you're lucky. How many others would give anything for this moment of potential, sitting patiently until it's your time to go? Thank you. I just give one big round of applause for Dr. Jeremy Tessera one more time. 
spoken like only you, you could. Thank you all for coming. There are a few announcements before we leave. Uh, on Saturday, May 21st, from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m., Stuff the Truck will be in the lot behind the 22nd Street Apartments. So for all the bad furniture, you're like, what am I gonna do with it? Stuff the Truck. Uh, please donate any usable items to the Habitat uh, Restore of the Lehigh Valley. From here, we will continue the evening's festivities at Rascals. It feels so weird to talk about Rascals now, like after that. Um, <laughs> we'll continue this evening's festivals at uh, Rascals. Uh, you're not allowed to drive, uh, sorry. You, there will be buses going both to and from the event. The buses are parked on Chu Street, and uh, we will start to load them one by one um, right after this ends in front of the CA. Uh, if you decide to drive your own car, Bear Security has been instructed to turn you away. Uh, please show your wristband to Bear Security before you get on the bus. Uh, when you arrive at Rascals, you will be given five drink tickets. Five. Uh, they're good for either beer or wine. Uh, you will also be given a $5 game card for your enjoyment. Uh, buses will return to campus uh, once they are full. Um, the event officially ends at midnight, but you can come back to Muhlenberg between 10 and midnight. Uh, so have fun, and uh, let's give a round of applause for Dr. Jeremy DeSera.